But, uh, but again, one of the idiomatic themes of it is, is the language of the hobo. Um, uh, when we think of uh, how much of our music uh, owes to, to the culture of hobos, um, Woody Guthrie, uh, Pete Seeger, Joe Hill. Um, this show was called Big Rock Candy Mountain, which is a, a, a well-known American song, and Burl Ives had a hit with it in the, in the early 50s. Um, there are some verses for that song that Burl doesn't sing, though. Um, and one of them is these hobos telling this young hobo, we're going to go to where uh, the rivers are whiskey and cigarettes grow on trees and the cops all have wooden legs and the mountain is made out of candy and they take them into the woods and they rape them. Um, and in, in the lyrics, uh, whenever you see the word bugger in the lyrics, not a good word for a song, you know. Um, uh, that's what they refer to. I, I don't want to be this, but they've always deleted uh, that lyric. But that, that song actually had this dark undercurrent of American poverty in it, and uh, and and hungry people. And we, we may think that they're not here anymore, but they are. Um, uh, the, the book that we're publishing, part of the money is going to go to the Greater Chicago Food Depository. They do not uh, have politics. They don't, they're not Republican or Democrat. They're not um, allowed with anybody. All they're about is feeding, a year ago they were feeding 6,000 people a day in Chicago. Now they feed 10,000 people a day in Chicago. Um, and so, you know, whatever's happened to us over the last few years, uh, I, I think making this work made me more aware of uh, the people that surround us, that we, we sometimes want to pretend are, are invisible. Um, I have five guys watching my windows in Chicago in my studio. I have a storefront on Ronald Damon Avenue, and um, you know, not one of them really ever get it clean. Um, but I got five different guys moving the dirt around in interesting ways. <laughs> um, I got a few guys uh, shoveling the snow. And I had one guy a couple of years ago, he came in and he, he was soaked, you know, he was soaked with water. And uh, it turns out the alderman sent the, uh, the fire trucks to turn the hoses loose on the fellows who were sleeping up under the Kennedy Expressway. And uh, I've always hated myself for not picking up the phone, not calling one of my reporter friends, I have many, not calling the alderman. I didn't do anything, I just, uh, I gave him a couple dollars. And that wasn't the answer. And uh, um, my, my friend Studs would have told me, you call him and you raise hell, kid. You, you put your thumb in their eye, the bastards will take over. Um, <laughs> one of the great Studs Turtle stories uh, happened with, with my friend Steve Earl. Um, one day I had a barbecue at my house and, and Studs came over. And Steve and Michael and Dacia were doing a reading at the Old Town School of Folk Music. And um, Studs would usually kind of sit in the living room and everybody would come by and, you know, we'd all kind of kiss the ring and, um, <laughs> and he'd been hearing about Steve Earl. I, I've heard about this guy, I've seen some of the lyrics, he's, I, I'm interested in him, he's, go get him, you know. So I got Steve and Steve sat down with him and he says, uh, so tell me about yourself, where, where are you from? And, and Steve said, well, I'm, you know, I'm a singer-songwriter, I'm from Shirts, Texas and, uh, and he goes, well, what are you doing now? And, and, and uh, Steve said, well, you know, I just made a new record. I, I had some difficulty earlier. I spent some time in jail. And, uh, and Studs, you know, was deaf as a post. He goes, so you went to Yale. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about Yale. <laughs> well, he, uh, what I learned from him was that um, nobody's boring. Everybody has a journey. Everybody has a story. Um, you know, part of making this work is kind of reconnecting me with things that I'm interested in and things I think that matter in our world right now. Uh, you know, who we are as a people, the quality of our compassion, the quality of uh, how we treat each other. And, uh, you know, it, it maybe took studs passing away and spending a lot of time in New Orleans to think about that stuff again, but I'm grateful for it. So.
That's a very long question to some of them. Answer to some of these questions. <laughs> Jesus Christ, diarrhea of the mouth. Yeah. Anybody else got a question? They're like, fuck no. <laughs> Did you find your language and uh, cadence in your poetry was different with this series than with the Chicago series, like Father or New Orleans uh, Flood series? Yeah. Yeah, I, I actually did. Um, I wanted them, uh, I read a lot of uh, haiku, I read a lot of Japanese poetry. Um, uh, some years ago, uh, out of, again, a conversation Steve Earl and I had, we found Busan and Isa and Basho, and I wanted just a certain kind of economy. Um, I'm really particular about text and work. Um, uh, and. You know, for years the big thing with, with, with me was, do I, do I take these thoughts and make a poem, or, or do I make a picture? And finally, uh, uh, when I first started making, combining the drawing and the collages, I just thought, I'm just going to put my poems in these. You know, uh, if they don't like them, they don't like them. You know, but uh, I just decided to do that and make them as a function of, of, of making the work. And, um, but for the hobo things. I wanted them to be a little, uh, a little more skeletal, a little less dressed up, um, a little less pretty, and uh, um, what I envisioned was that all of these things were maybe happening in the, in the mind of one or two people, you know, and, and it was a simple, kind of not, not terribly wordy narrative uh, um, that I wanted to have, you know, a, a, a kind of resonance. You know, I want, I want people to be able to look at them and then eventually they find the poem and, and take something with them from that. Um, you know, I wanted them to be a little less dressed up than the things that I put in, you know, the New Orleans work or, or the Chicago work. Um, is this whole language still being used? That's one question. The other one really wants to Mostly by tattoo artists. They love, you know. But, Well, you know, just I've gotten three emails this week from people who said that people have actually started writing the rails again, mm -hmm. which now is really dangerous because a lot of the if you're going right in the boxcar, I mean, only a really good agile guy can ride under the train on those rails. Um, that takes a great deal of physical strength. Um, but there are guys who will jump on flat cars and guys who will jump on open box cars. But those open box cars now close by mechanism, which means they don't have people going around to check if anybody's in there. So it's it's dangerous. But I have heard people who started doing that again. Uh, I, th I think with these economic times, I think uh, um, you know I, th I thought this this book would be apropos because uh, we live in a time when people are having to get by on a great deal less, and uh, and. You know, I, I, I've also seen, you know, encouraging signs that people have been kinder to each other, you know. In New York, I, I, I'm kind of proud of New Yorkers, because I don't know how often I see somebody come out of a restaurant with, you know, their leftovers or a takeout bag and give it to a homeless person. I see that here a lot, you know, and I see it in New Orleans a lot. Um, in Chicago, we have a Mayor Daly who likes to pretend that we don't have any homeless people. Um, which is unfortunate. Um, uh, you know, what I told you before about the Mopri law, that was a law on the books until 1978. The police could stop you if you didn't have a dollar in your pocket. You were guilty of Mopri. You know, you could be a career mope in Chicago. It's like, unbelievable. 